All right. Hello. Uh, again, this is Silas Beers. I am the Wildlife Technician at Biodiversity Works, and I'm going to do a little recording on how to best be beach bird aware and how to best share the shore when cleaning vineyard beaches. This talk was given yesterday at a Zoom, but we had some audio difficulties. We found out the issue is with my computer's microphone, particularly with Zoom. It's a very interesting and specific issue, but hopefully this is clears it up with this headset now, and you'll be able to hear everything I say, and you can uh, just save this video and have it around for any information that you may want. So uh, first, before we get dive into the content of this video, uh, I would like to talk a little bit more about our organization. So Biodiversity Works is a conservation nonprofit that operates solely on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, we have a whole bunch of different field programs that Liz and I work on, so not We'll talk specifically about beach birds, but just know what's going on in the background. Uh, we do programs with turtles. We do programs with snakes. So here's Liz holding a black racer. Uh, and we have a road crossing for black racers here at Long Point Wildlife Refuge. Here I am tracking the turtles. We do work uh, monitoring white nose syndrome and vineyard bats here going on. Um, and then a couple of our different programs that we have. So here's Matt Pelican. He's the director of Mar Martha's Vineyard Atlas of Life which we're trying to census the biodiversity across the entire island, uh, uses iNaturalist as a platform. And so any observations you make on iNaturalist just immediately get scooped up for since they're on the vineyard. And we are up to nearly 40,000 observations and just over 4,000 species for that program. And then here is Rich Kaus. He is our director of Natural Neighbors, another program in Biodiversity Works in which you can actually make a reservation uh, and meet or Rich Kaus will come to your property and he can sort of census the habitat uh, at your property and make recommendations on how to make it more hospitable to flora and fauna, native flora and fauna specifically, um, and come up with recommendations. And many of you might already be a natural neighbor or participating in Atlas of Life. But so that's just a little bit more about what biodiversity does. But here we will zoom into this beach bird section here. So what we want to sort of do in, in sort of at a broad scope, we'll have these signs that will be going out this year. So make sure you keep an eye out. But this is generally the species that you're most frequently going to see on the beach. Some of them are migratory, some of them stay year round, some of them nest, and some of them just move through on their migratory pathway. And so this is a fun interactive sign that our colleague Don Witherington helped uh, make with us. And so these are all of her illustrations. Very, very beautiful. Um, I won't spend too much time elaborating on, on every single one of these species. We don't monitor for every single one of these species, but this is sort of just, you can use the sign as a fun checklist. So keep an eye out for it. But we will go ahead and zoom in on specifically the species that we monitor now. So here we will start off with the little gray guy right here, the piping plover. So piping plovers, first off, I'll mention that they are state and federally threatened. So they are protected by both the Endangered Species Act and the Massachusetts Endangered Species Act. And it's sort of the whole reason that we have uh, beach monitoring programs, not specifically for piping plovers, uh, but just for these listed species. And we wanna make sure that they're protected. They have a couple, so, uh, First, I'll cover when they get on the vineyard. So they arrive in late March, they're already here and they'll stay through September before migrating uh, back south. And their nesting season is in late April and then goes through early July. And so sort of in late April, we'll start seeing these uh, depressions that they build. So these are called scrapes. And so they basically just, their nesting strategy is they make little divots in the sand and then the eggs are laid directly in them on the ground. So you can see sort of why they have vulnerable nesting behaviors. And then so those nesting attempts will go through July. Sometimes if they have their first nest attempt fail, they'll continue successive nesting attempts later into the season that can sort of extend that nesting period. Uh, they go up to four egg nests. So you can see a uh, full clutch here that this bird is sitting on, four different eggs directly in the sand again. And that chick rearing, depending on when their nests hatch. So if you have one that hatches in that late April, those can kind of, that chick rearing period will go through late May. But if you have one of those later nests in July, that can go all the way into August. So we sort of generally we treat the summer from late April to early August, sort of maybe even into late August as the breeding season for these species. And that's pretty, holds pretty constant for all of the birds that we monitor. Turns go a little bit later, but generally keep that in mind that summer, that is when these birds are active and they're using the Martha's Vineyard beaches as nesting. And so we're gearing right up on it. And that's why we're giving this presentation today. I did want to draw your attention to a couple of interesting behaviors, especially nest protection behaviors or chick protection behaviors that piping plovers do that you might see, especially if you're going out and doing trash cleanups or trash pickups on the beaches. So they 
will often come up to you and do little cute peeps. And it's actually very cute. Unfortunately, it's adorable when they come up and they peep at you. But instead of being cute and they're not saying hello, this is actually typically a warning sign. So if you're having an adult piping plover coming up to you and peeping or giving little whispery warning calls, that's probably telling you that you are too close to one of its nests. And I'll show you a little bit how well camouflage your nest can be in a little bit. So generally you wanna take that information that the adult is giving you. And if you start having these warning calls, you want to move further down the beach into the wet sand in the intertidal area and continue walking until you stop seeing these behaviors. One special behavior that they do that I wanna draw even more special attention to is this broken wing display. And so this is sort of a distraction behavior that the adults will do, in which case they think you are far too close to their nest and they're trying to draw your attention, look like they're injured. So imagine if you were a predator and they see a weakened bird that's gonna be a lot tastier than an egg. And so they're hoping that a predator will follow them and they'll feign like they're injured, draw all of your attention to them and hopefully you lose interest in the nest. So if you start seeing a bird acting like it has a broken wing or injured around you and it's making itself super conspicuous and looking injured that means you are definitely too close to a nest you should stop and essentially watch every single step that you take as you head down towards the wet sand again in the intertidal area uh, until these birds stop doing these behaviors so that's just a good overview of what a piping plover is when they're nesting and the behaviors that you should be on the lookout for when you're walking on the beach so now we'll shift our focus to the american oyster catcher american oyster catchers are a species of special concern they're being monitored closely they have the same nesting strategy as piping plovers in which they do a nest bowl and directly in the sand and lay their eggs and they go up to three in a clutch. They also show up in sort of mid-March, maybe just a slight tinge earlier than piping plovers, and they stay a fair amount later. Uh, on the island. Again, they are already here. And we've had instances where they overwinter. Uh, sometimes they've stayed as late as December. They've caught up on the uh, Christmas bird count. We've showed up on Christmas bird count American oyster catchers have. And so they stay around on the vineyard a little bit longer than piping plovers do. Their nesting season, though, is still equivalent to piping plovers, sort of that mid-April through early July. And then that chick rearing tend, extends into August, especially if those late July or those early July nests hatch uh, late in the season. So kind of just same thing as plovers. You can just kind of keep it in your mind. I'll keep reiterating it. Summer months, this is when the nesting season is and where you'll be seeing us be most active and have fencing on the beaches. So their uh, nest protection behaviors are a little bit different than piping plovers. They, as you can see, are much more conspicuous, much more obvious, attractive looking birds, this bright orange beak where the plovers are sort of gray and sand colored. And they know that they're conspicuous and they use it to their advantage. So the oyster catcher nest be protection behavior is that when you feel that you are get when they feel that you are getting too close to a nest or a predator is getting too close to the nest, instead of warning call or trying to draw your attention away with a broken wing, will actually just get up and walk off and hope that you um using its conspicuous coloration that you will be drawn your attention to that before you even have a chance to realize that there is a nest going on. So it's a little bit more difficult to notice if there's an oyster catcher nest because they just quietly walk away. But if you see an oyster catcher it seems to be hurriedly moving. Um, especially if you like round a corner and oyster catcher hops up and moves quickly, that means you are probably too close to a nest. Um, and again, just sort of move to the intertidal, that wet sand area. And so now I'll go ahead and move on and talk about our terns and skimmers. I group them all together because they all have similar nesting and nest protection strategies. First, I'll give you a couple little ID cues for each of them. So this is uh, and the species that nest on Martha's Vineyard. Here is uh, a least tern. And so they are the smallest of terns and they have this conspicuous yellow beak. Here you see one holding a fish. If you have a common term, they're a little bit bigger. During breeding plumage, they have this orange beak that fades into black. Uh, and they're easily distinguishable in breeding plumage from the roseate tern, which uh, in breeding plumage, again, has this light rosy wash in which they get their name on their breast and then a jet black beak. And so during non-breeding plumage, these guys are a little bit more difficult to tell apart, but during breeding plumage, there's pretty stark dif differences. And then we have our black skimmers. So actually, Martha's Vineyard is home to the northernmost uh, black skimmer colony um, in their range. And so it's it's kind of a unique uh, thing that Martha's Vineyard uh, boasts is is our northernmost black skimmer colony. And they are not terns. They're related to terns, but not in the same family. They're sort of their own special thing. And the reason they get their name skimmer is because they have a this this unique beak. So if you see this lower mandible is much longer than this bottom one. And then their foraging strategy is they drop 
their lower mandible into the water and will just sort of glide along, dropping that lower mandible in and picking up fish as they go. So that's where they get their name. It's very cool to watch. And when they have chicks, you can sign up. You, you get to see the chicks learning how to skim. And it's like any child like trying to learn how to ride a bike or something. It does not go very well at the first thing, but then eventually they pick it up and it's very cool. Uh, so some of the protection or the statuses for these least terns are the same as piping plovers. They are federally and state threatened and roseate terns are federally and state endangered. So they have the highest level of protections. Common terns, black skimmers are species of special concern as well. Uh, their nesting strategies, these are all colonial nesters. And therefore, it is much more conspicuous when they have and much less discreet when they're in nesting areas. Usually there are hundreds of birds. They are very loud. And so you're not going to be surprised by any sort of nesting turn colony. And so we won't go into as much about uh, how to avoid them. Their nest protection behaviors are also much less discreet. They will be dive bombing you. They will be screaming at you and they will make it very, very clear that you are too close to their nest. And you will generally want to get out of the way anyway, because birds are raining from the sky at you and trying to take off your head. Um, so if you see that happening, just move again to the wet sand and the intertidal area uh, until they stop that behavior, which I imagine you would want to do anyway. So then I've told you a little bit about the nest behaviors that you might see. Uh, I wanted to show you the nest and the reason that we're paying special attention to these nest protection behaviors is because sometimes these nests are very, very hard to see. So here you have an oyster catcher nest, and it's kind of a good view of a nest bowl that I was talking about, these depressions in the sand. Oftentimes they'll be adorned with little shells as the male tries to make it look very pretty for the female to select that nest bowl. Um, but what I want to kind of point out as we continue looking at sort of these up close and we'll kind of zoom out as we go, these pictures is over millions of years of these beach nesting bird species, they have evolved to make their eggs look like rocks on the beach. And as you zoom out, it becomes much, much more difficult to see them. Imagine you're a predator that's moving along the beach. Uh, so we're like a mesos predator. So we have skunks, raccoons, those are common uh, nest predators here on the vineyard. Uh, if you're just moving along and you just sort of scanning, you might just walk right past that because it looks just like a rock on the beach. So as we kind of keep going through, here's a least turn nest, uh, another good look at the depression, uh, there's nest bowls or scrapes. And then we have a common turn nest here. So they use a little thatching. Um, but then I'm wondering if some of you also might not have noticed that there's also a piping plover nest in this exact same picture. So you can kind of see your attention's drawn to the common turn nest, and then you just might have totally blown away. Uh, and so well, again, what I'm pointing out, they're very well camouflaged. And as we zoom out and I sort of, as you're walking on the beach, this is much more what your view is. I'm not expecting you to be able to see the nest. That's why we have the little guiding circles. That's not what these pictures are for. But what they are for is at the landscape level, this is what you'll be seeing. And you can see just how well camouflaged they are in at that sort of level. And I also want to show as we kind of click through these that though this this is a good example of, of prime habitat. If you were to look up good nesting habitat for piping plovers, oyster catchers, least turns, you would see a picture that sort of looks like this, but they don't always exclusively nest in that. So we have a really cobbly beach here, an oyster catcher nest nested in this case, sort of at the edge of the dunes, less cobble going on here. You have a little bit of a slope. Sometimes they're even right in the dunes and in the dune grass. And so the point that I'm trying to make here is that while we try and fence off these prime habitat areas, there are going to be instances where, especially this year after the big storms that came across the South Shore, there's going to be instances where birds are nesting maybe sometimes out of uh, or fencing or in habitats that we don't necessarily uh, expect or associate with uh, nesting territory. So just always be cautious. And especially if birds are making behaviors uh, or nest protection behaviors at you, you're being very cognizant of that and not just assuming that this doesn't look like great habitat. Uh, there might, there's probably not a nest here. So you don't want to make those assumptions. You want to uh, listen to what the birds are telling you and just assume that there could be nests everywhere. So now that I've shown you what the nests look like and kind of areas that they can be, we're going to have some challenges. We have three different sequences or sets of images where I'll show you the picture without the guiding circle. And I want you to see if you can find the nest. It's sort of just a little test uh, and continuing to, to bang home those points that I've been making. And so we'll give you like five seconds here. So hopefully you found this one. We have a nice piping plover nest right in the middle uh, sitting. Um, but you can see as you zoom out, they sort of look more and more like rocks. And 
All right. I hope you found this one. Still nice right in the center of the picture, but kind of guided by, guarded by some dune grass, kind of right at the edge of the dunes. Um, we also have uh, potentially what might be some other old scrapes around the area. The male, when they're doing uh, their courtship of the female, will make multiple scrapes, make them all look as pretty as they can, monitor, uh, keep all of them uh, nice and kept and nice and well kept for the female and the female will choose which one she wants to lay the eggs in and that scrape becomes a nest bowl. So we don't want to destroy any scrapes that we find. And so that's always why we're protecting the habitat, not just the areas of the nesting. And now the last one and probably the hardest one. I gave you a little bit longer on that one. You're also welcome to pause the video, but here we have uh, right here. And so it just blends in very, very well, especially on these sort of cobbly beaches. And so again, just bringing home the point, these are well camouflaged nests. They have evolved after millions of years to look like little rocks on the beach. And so if you're getting parental protection behaviors, but you don't see a nest, just assume that there is one is the point that we're trying to get home and don't assume uh, that they are only in the fencing. And then, so as we kind of move further into the season, uh, it's as hard as it is to find nests, at least they don't move. They're generally in the same area over and over again. But when the chicks hatch, then they are often well camouflaged with the beach. I mean, as you can see, it's just a little cotton ball and toothpicks here, but they move. And so it's like, I, I like to draw the comparison to if, if you have children or if any of your friends have had children, uh, and then how much trouble they had controlling their toddlers. Now imagine you have four of them all at the same time. So plover chicks and oyster catcher chicks are precocial, meaning that within hours after they hatch, they get up and they start foraging and running around. And we joke that oyster catcher chicks and pl plover chicks sometimes don't have plover and oyster catcher conservation in mind. They will run kind of wherever, and you'll see that the adults are definitely haggard and wary and uh, very stressed trying to herd them around and keep them in areas that are safe. So the the point that I'm making is that when chicks hatch, we have areas that we've fenced off for them, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the chicks are going to use that. We can't tell you where the chicks are 24-7. So especially during these times, as we move into uh, late May and August, be very, very aware of um that there might be chicks in areas that you wouldn't expect. And we do try and give you some sort of heads up. We know when chicks are going to be, when we find the nest, we have good ideas of when they're going to hatch, uh, usually to the day. And we post signs like this. And so if you see these, this is just a really good cue. And you basically just do exactly what the sign tells you, especially if you start hearing these warning, those peeping sounds. Uh, oyster catchers have a very distinct chick call that they'll give um, that they want you to know that you're not out of the area. So they, the parents will make it obvious and they'll tell you. So if you start hearing things like that, we want you to do what the sign says. We want you to stop and be very, very aware. And I hopefully that you would want to do that anyway, because if that means that there might be chicks around and so you could have some chance for very good wildlife viewing, but we want you to move to the intertidal area that wet sand again until the animals stop but then from that area, then yes, you can stay and watch. There might be some cool uh, behavior going on. You want to give them around 150 feet uh, of, of space, but use those cues, make sure that you're paying attention to what the sign says when the kit, when the chicks are out there. But we don't expect you to do this all yourself. This is what I'm paid for, uh, paid to do is to find these nests and, and make sure that you have adequate protection. I'm letting you know the areas that need to be uh, avoided for these nesting birds. And so when we're going out on the beach, uh, what you're likely to be seeing and what you, I'm sure you have seen is this symbolic fencing in which we have posts and then there's string uh, that ties them all together. And those areas are usually around um, sites that we or, or, or areas on the beach that we know that birds like to nest they have very high nesting site fidelity meaning that they find a spot that they like and they're likely to come back to it year after year after year so normally with pretty high accuracy if we know that we have birds coming back we can fence off the area before they even arrive or before they set up their territories and usually they will nest in, in between it but if we get a new younger adult that's coming in and filling a hole then sometimes they don't have these established territories they're still learning what the good areas to nest are and we'll see instances where they nest outside side of the fencing. So it's a good boundary and the fencing that we set, we know that there are birds that like to nest in these areas. So be very cognizant of it, but it's definitely not uh, a stead and fast rule that all nests will be inside these fencing. As the season progresses, we might run into, you might start seeing these pop up on the beach. These are predator exclosures. And so they're attempts to 
uh, nest predation by skunks or raccoons or crows are probably the most common on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, these are attempts to to remove the, that threat. And so these uh, fences, the squares are big enough that the adult plovers can walk in and out and access their nest easily. But skunks and raccoons have no access. They're dug into the beach so they can't dig under. And then crows can't access because we have this netting on top. And so if you see one of these, then it's very good indication that there is a nest probably right in the middle of it, uh, or maybe there's chicks around. So again, this is just a target that there are plover chicks and nests in the area. So uh, be very, very aware of those. And we'll post signage that can be very uh, site specific. Sometimes you can see that we had this one at Lucy Vincent telling dog walkers to please leash their dogs as you go on. Uh, we prefer in the summer from May to August that you just try and keep your dogs off the beach. If any instance that you are on the beach, uh, make sure that they are leashed. These are natural predators and stress plovers out much more than humans do. So going back to these disclosures, we have this instance that I want to use as an example to show that I'm not just making all of this up. So we have this instance last year where we have, you can see here, this is an adult piping plover that's incubating on the nest. And we have actually some chicks here. So this is probably nest was in the middle of hatching. It's either incubating some chicks or the eggs in the middle of hatching right here. This was sort of right around when this was supposed to be hatching. And we have uh, you can kind of see the chicks move and one's popped up right here. And so you can see the one here and then one pops up that was sitting down right here. And so you can see the other thing that you can note is that we have these people that are walking right by and they're in the intertidal zone. They're doing exactly what we would ask them to do. They're just enjoying the beach. And you can see here, the plover does not care in the slightest. It is totally feels very safe. If there was a dog, I bet you this plover would be up and off the nest and wary. But if it's on the leash and in the intertidal zone, it probably would be stressed for just a small amount of time, but completely calm with just people. Um, that's going on. But unfortunately, so I'll draw your attention to the date. So June 20th at 1010, less than 24 hours later, we had this unfortunate incident where some kids came in and they started playing baseball inside the fencing. And you can see the chicks are gone. The parents are gone. And this was a very stressful event for them. And unfortunately, we never actually saw these chicks again. And so we're... Um, we weren't able to determine, uh, since we weren't there and this was all caught in a trail camera, what the exact cause of chick loss was. It's unlikely that these kids actually caused the demise of the chicks or the parent. And I, I'm not saying that these kids were feeling uh, animosity towards the plovers. I doubt that they meant any ill will or harm. They likely just didn't know. That's why we give talks like this. But I want to illustrate the effect that it can have. So in the case, even if the kids didn't initially harm it uh, what probably happened this super stressful event the plover parent was probably alarm calling like crazy trying to keep its chicks move them out of the way and there are many crows at this specific site and so that likely drew in predator attention to where the nest was to where the chicks were and um so it's just an example of how this sort of unfortunate event uh can lead to pretty disastrous consequences to chicks. And so we want to make sure that we're avoiding, we're following attention to fencing. And especially in an instance where we see this exclosure, we definitely do not want to be entering the fencing ever. So I keep on mentioning going in the wet sand. So here's a nice graphic that we have just to really bang home this point. So this is the area that we're most normally going to see plovers nesting. I told you it's not 100%. They can be in the dunes. They can be sort of out of the areas. But this is where the area that you want to avoid during this breeding season. We don't want to be walking through this. If there's trash and especially with inside fencing that you want to pick up, uh, it's best to just leave that be and let us know that there's something. And say if you have a balloon or something that gets caught in the exposure, we'd probably recommend that you either contact us or call us and we can let you know the specifics of that nest or just let us know that there's a balloon there and we would come and get it at a time that it's best safe. But we want to be walking in this wet sand, this intertidal. There's not going to be any nesting where the uh, tide is coming up and down. Uh, so these are generally safe areas to watch or to walk and to do wildlife viewing. And this is how we monitor too. This, we're not walking through the nesting area. Oftentimes we'll be coming through just like this graphic shows, uh, moving along in the inner tidal. And then if any instance that comes up that I need to go in, or if I find a nest or if I need to put fencing up, will enter. But when I'm doing just a site monitor, just to check what's going on, I'm walking in the inner tidal and I have my binoculars. And so this is what we do. This is the behaviors that we follow. Uh, and we want to give 150 feet to uh, nesting chicks. So, so you kind of remember that number, remember that key to be moving in the wet sand inner tidal. Um, that's where the chicks and adults will feel most safe to have you there. 
So I implore you to take a picture of this in instances that you do see something that you want to alert us to. We have different monitoring organizations across the whole of the island. And so you can kind of look at this map and, and hopefully take the picture of it and note which monitoring organization is monitoring where. And so if you find something, say you're at Norton Point, that's a Mass Audubon uh, monitored beach. And so you would contact Mass Audubon or if you're on, say, uh, Dogfish Bar, then that's one that we monitor. And so you have the different content. And of course, on Chappie, all of the trustees, properties, way squee uh, over there. And so take a picture of this and you'll just have it for your reference. Those of you that visit Little Beach, it's Sheriff's Meadow owned. So Sheriff's Meadow Foundation owns Little Beach, but we're contracted to do the monitoring there. So you can contact either of us for that. And then take a picture again here. This is the contact information. And so for the most descriptive, this is my contact information. This is my cell phone number and this is my email. Uh, so that's the most Easy, either of either of those options will get in contact with me immediately. Uh, if you're on one of these other sites monitoring, you have these contacts. I don't want to give out the uh, very specific lead monitors, phone numbers or anything, but you can contact this. But also if you're on the beach and you don't have the picture with you and you're just, or you just don't know necessarily where you are and you see something, you can just let me know, take pictures, uh, tell generally where you are on the beach. I know where all of the monitoring boundaries are. I know the lead monitors for all of these areas. So you can just let me know and I will either pass it along uh, or maybe it will be my site. So I uh, take a picture of this site again, of this slide again, um, just for your reference if you're out there on the beach. So kind of the last big take home messages of how you can help. And so the big, big one, and I've said it over and over again in this presentation, because it's important. We don't want you to go in the fencing. The fencing is put up to protect the habitat and the, or the chicks, the nests and the habitat for these nesting birds. Uh, they, they're federally threatened and endangered in some cases. And so we want to make sure that they have the, uh, the space that we need and we're sharing the shore with them adequately. Again, we would like for you to keep your dogs off the beach. Um, in instances that they are on the beach, make sure that they are on the leech. We would prefer that you just keep them off. These are uh, natural predators. They stress birds out much more than people do. Um, and so it's best to just keep them off again from those uh, months of May through August. And if you see, say some, see something, say something, and this could be really anything. If you see uh, fencing is down, or if you find a nest that seems to be outside of fencing, or if you see somebody that's going in, I'm not necessarily asking you to go and confront the person. I mean, you're welcome to if you feel brave enough, or, or um, but these are pieces of information that we want to know. Say if we have an instance where a nest seems to be doing very well and then all of a sudden has disappeared or becomes abandoned by the adults, and we don't know why, but somebody saw that there was a dog running around inside the fencing the other day, uh, we're not asking that you have gone and confront the people. That's sort of what we're supposed to be doing. Um, but if we have that piece of information, then we can kind of piece together the puzzle of what might have happened in that instance. And so those are just pieces of information, a, a good examples of things that you might want to tell me. So you can always contact those qualified monitors in the slide uh, that I posted earlier that hopefully you took a picture of um, that you have that information for. And we do like when you send pictures of what's going on, they give us a better idea. If you find a nest, maybe you leave something in the dunes or you leave something uh, on the front beach uh, that gives an indicator or marks, leads us to where the nest was. So those are good things. And you could take pictures of all of that or take pictures and, and give uh, stationary points that you used as reference to it or things that are on the beach, funny looking rocks or something. Uh, but don't upload any pictures of the nest to social media or to use iNaturalist. They're poachers. We don't want to be drawing attention to people that do have animosity towards the short ne beach nesting birds. So we don't recommend, we ask that you don't upload those um, to anything, but you do take them and, and send them to us if you find anything. What we do want you to upload or, or share is if you have instances where you find these uh, banded birds. So you see these oyster catchers and they have these yellow bands here. Uh, if you find an instance like that, we're using those as are uh, used for population monitoring, capture recap, uh, capture mark recapture studies, um, and, and just knowing how the population is doing uh, and the survivability of adults as they and, and where they show up along their migratory pathway. So definitely share that information. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different uh, resources for that. If you look up USGS uh, Bird Banding Laboratory, a lot of times that's where you'll do it. Uh, oyster catchers have a specific, or you can share them with us and we'll send them to the right people. Um, but that's, that's just a cool thing that you can sow. And we definitely want you to share that information. 
Again, so we will be out uh, tomorrow now on Saturday at 2 p.m. And so if you have questions about what was in this presentation or you just want to come and meet us and, and learn something more specifically about the birds, that's what this opportunity is for. I will be uh, putting up fencing. And so if you're interested in how that process goes and how we choose what areas to fence off, uh, that information will be readily available um, and it should just be a good time. It's supposed, weather's supposed to be nice. It's be nice to have a nice day. It's currently raining where I'm sitting. Uh, it's been raining. feels like all week. Um, so just putting that on your radar, 2 p.m. at Lighthouse Beach, we will be out there um, going over this material again and talking about anything that we want to talk about. And so uh, hopefully we will see you there. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but if you have anything, you can either email me at the contact information or come again, see me on Saturday at Lighthouse Beach. All right. Thank you guys so much.